to interact with ovarian hyperstimulation. I'm sure we would all like, like to face this complication in IVF because it's the worst for the clinician to face this after the embryo transfer and even for the embryologist. So ovarian hyperstimulation, this is a nitrogenic complication resulting from ovarian stimulation in IVF and ICSI. It is the gravest complication of so-called controlled ovarian hyperstimulation which goes far too often uncontrolled. It is second only to higher order multiple birth on the list of adverse outcomes which need to be minimized or completely eliminated. So if we come to classification, we can classify it as mild, moderate, severe and critical. Severe in which we have ascites, hydrothorax, oliguria and liver dysfunction. It can also be classified as early onset and late onset, especially when implantation occurs. So in ART without ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, we have to first understand the disease, what is the prediction, the prevention, implementation and the treatment, the near horizons. And we hope that we never have to treat severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So mainly the main culprit in ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is the vascular endothelial growth factor, which is responsible for follicular growth, corporeal function, ovarian angiogenesis, neovascularization, and acceleration of vasopermeability. So we have to understand this disease. VEGF is expressed after LH search and is enhanced by HCG in a dose and time dependent fashion. The kinetics and level of VEGF correlates with the severity of ovarian hyperstimulation, the clinical course, capillary leakage, leukocytosis and increased hematocrit. So this is the chart which the main culprit is VEGF. So this is the pathogenesis which remains enigmatic. The final pathway, the, there are many follicles long and high E2 levels and sustained LH surge which cause ovarian hyperstimulation. So if we come to prediction, we have the PCOS patients in which we have to be very careful when we start their induction. Suddenly you see multiple follicles and in younger age group, low body weight, where we have previous ovarian hyperstimulation, high E2 levels, and large number of follicles. And when we use HCG to trigger ovulation and HCG for luteal support. So how do we reduce the chances? We avoid the flare up. That is, we should have fewer follicles, low E2 levels. So these are the various ways where we can reduce the chances. We say coasting, where we stop the gonadotrophin stimulation we continue the agonist suppression until the estrogen levels decline before we proceed for an egg collection. We give low dose of HCG to trigger ovulation, freezing of all embryos. Recently, we have started using dopamine agonists, the cabergolin and IV calcium. So there is a study in a, which was published which says that there is no evidence to suggest the benefit when we compare coasting to other methods. When we use low dose of HCG, the rationale is HCG induces VEGF expression is dose dependent and it causes lesser chances of ovarian hyperstimulation. When we freeze all embryos, we do not do the transfer in that cycle and we do frozen embryo transfer. The dopamine receptor 2 agonists which show to inactivate the VEGF receptors. They reduce hemoconcentration in women with ovarian hyperstimulation after IVF compared to placebo. So recently IV calcium gluconate has also been used, which increased calcium inhibits renin secretion, reduced renin secretion, 
decreased angiotensin 2 and stimulatory effect of angiotensin 2 on VEGF production would be attenuated. We give intravenous 10% calcium gluconate, 10 ml in 20 ml saline on the day of ovum pickup, day 1, day 2 and day 3. So how do we avoid the flare-up? We withhold the HCG, cancel the cycle which is not feasible. Nobody would like to cancel the cycle because of economic reasons also and it's very difficult to give reply to the patient. Natural cycle IVF, we have mild IVF, IVM and GNRH agonist to trigger ovulation. So in natural IVF cycle, we have various problems with the natural cycle. We have to do close monitoring of LHs and there can be spontaneous LH surges. The pregnancy rate per embryo transfer is lower and the take home baby rate is also pretty low. So then we have mild ovarian st stimulation for IVF which we call soft protocol or soft IVF in which we apply a daily dose of 150 IU of recombinant FSH starting on cycle day 5 along with the antagonist which we can have a flexible start. So these are the various advantages of mild stimulation versus the disadvantage, the similar life birth rates, reduced complexity, reduced patient discomfort, reduced risk of ovarian hyperstimulation, decreased dropout rates and reduced cost, beneficial effect on oocyte quality also because aneuploidy is seen when large number of oocytes are retrieved and chances of abortion, miscarriage are also more. But we have some disadvantages, there are cancellation rates, and less margin for suboptimal laboratory performance. If your lab is not up to the mark, you'll have very few sites and very few embryos for cryopreservation also. So IVM, we have pregnancy rates 20 and 30% in PCOS, in women with normal, and 30% in women with normal ovaries. So there are approximately 1,300 IVM babies worldwide and birth and perinatal outcome of only some 400 babies have been reported so far and the reports have been reassuring. There are fewer multiple pregnancies compared to standard IVF treatments. So there is a study which shows that with IVM you have large offspring syndrome. A review of study of babies born after IVM fertility has suggested that they are more likely to be born larger than normal and there are more difficult births requiring obstetric interventions such as cesareans. So then another option is we trigger the ovulation with GNRH analogs. The biological activity of HCG is six times greater than that of LH. So due to its long half-life and affinity for the common receptors. So if we trigger it with GNRH analog, the chances of ovarian hyperstimulation become less. So if we see we have the longest exposure with HCG, short exposure, exposure with spontaneous ovulation and in GNRH analogs we have very short exposure. So then we have cryopreservation and selective embryo transfer. We cryopreserve the embryos and transfer one at a time in consecutive natural cycles. This eliminates ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and multiple pregnancy rates. Single stimulation in a simple five long-acting recombinant FSH alpha GNRH analog antagonist cycle and we trigger by GNRH analog and freeze all the embryos. Then we cry out the embryos in consecutive cycles and transfer them. With this approach, the two major complications of controlled ovarian hyperstimulation for IVF could be eliminated without affecting the outcome. We won't have multiple births, we won't have to do embryo reduction and will avoid ovarian hyperstimulation also. So there are new treatment modalities. We have PEDF, the rescue of long protocol cycles and we tailor it by anti-malarian hormone. So in this new novel treatment for ovarian hyperstimulation using pigment epithelium derived factor which is a potent anti-angiogenic factor we provide a comprehensive explanation for the pathophysiology of ovarian hyperstimulation, an imbalance between the high expression levels of the proangiogenic factor 
VEGF and the anti-angiogenic factor PEDF. A replacement therapy with recombinant PEDF is suggested as an innovative physiological treatment for ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. We have antagonists rescue of a long protocol IVF cycle and GNRH agonist trigger to avoid ovarian hyperstimulation. In IVF patients treated under long protocol which have high risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, cycles can be re rescued by we withdraw the agonist, replace it with antagonist and trigger the ovulation with agonist bolus. So then we have antimalarian hormone which is expressed in preantral and small antral follicles. It is a good indicator of the size of ovarian antral follicle pool. So planning and efficiency, then how do we avoid it? We have classified high responders, low responders, normal responders. The prediction of the response allows the planning agonist and antagonist and dose of FSH to optimize the results and to avoid the complications. So, in conclusion, ART without ovarian hyperstimulation is a viable option. Uh, we can take two or three questions from the previous two lectures.